<clears throat> I, I, my favorite comment from the break, coming back in from break, some guy walks up to me and says, mind-blowing stuff, you made my head hurt. I said, we're not done yet. <laughs> All right. So where we finished up was, we were looking at uh, flow, the importance of flow, <clears throat> and what's relevant information. So how do we manage flow with relevant information? Because what we said was, is as I improve visibility, that impacts variability. As I impact variability, then it improves uh, flow. It's improve flow, improve ROI. So what is visibility? It's not just more data. Can't stress this enough. It's not just more data. Visibility is to the flow of relevant information. Okay, it's relevant information and relevant material, and it's across our organization. So why do we want that? Well, because what it does, and I think the most important thing, is that it aligns priorities. Balanced scorecard, by definition, is putting in conflict. We want alignment of priorities, alignment of schedules, and alignment of execution. So then what happens to us is that that then speeds conflict resolution. Because we're always going to come into conflicts, but how we get out of a conflict is by examining the assumptions that are holding us in that conflict that are causing us to oscillate between two bimodal positions. And then we want to define when and where to act, and then the most interesting thing is, is when we give people relevant information they will self-organize to solve problems and act. They don't need to have this hierarchy. We can have these uh, self-managed teams because they have the visibility. So people will self-organize to act. So, doesn't work. You sure it's not the other one? Let's try this one. There we go. Uh. <laughs> It's one of these two. I okay. have not ascertained yet in my, my uh, one factor at a time we, to figure out which one. We can test this. I have a <laughs> hypothesis. We can figure it out. So the reality is, is you cannot measure what you can't see. We also cannot improve what we can't see. It's this one. Okay. So getting smarter. What's our blueprint? Where are we going to take you in the second part of this presentation? It's really three steps. The first step is about installing the thoughtware. The most difficult part of all of this is what happens between your ears. It's about how you think. It has nothing to do with the software, the organizational structure, some fancy you know, uh, computer system. It's about the thoughtware. How do we get the right thoughtware into the organization? The second is, is how do we become demand-driven? And what is demand-driven? The demand-driven is to be able to sense changes and adapt, which by definition is the embracement of an idea of a complex adaptive system. And then the third, I can only be sustainable if I then employ the my smart metrics to sustain the whole process. So learning to think systematically, and I'm going to turn it back over to Deb. Okay. <clears throat> There's a reason why if you contact me, my email is um, D. Smith at thoughtwarepeople.com. Because years and years and years ago, when we started Constraints Management Group in 97, I have a brilliant uh, child who forced me to start that company. Um, he shamed me into it. So he became the managing partner, and I was the only thing he had to manage, which is another story. But he is the marketing genius who said, Well, we're thoughtware people. And I said, Well, is that so we don't get confused with the thoughtware monkeys? Um, but so I have the longest email address in the world, but thoughtware is where it starts. Because if you don't have the right thinking, then you can't possibly know how to act. And thoughtware comes before software. And thoughtware is about thinking and getting the organization to think systemically. So that's where we always start. And we're going to start with a case for you. So I put together, I went and grabbed um, a, lot of our, a lot of our material is based in manufacturing, which you've probably gathered. But I have a lot of um, companies that have a very strong management project component. So I picked one that is strictly an engineer to order, so that should make everybody in here happy. <clears throat> and we're going to pick that, and I'm going to take you through an iteration of how to become demand-driven. So effects of all of our improvement efforts, where did they go, guys? I mean, you can tell me what you want. I've seen everybody say, oh, well, we have. We can do that 10 times faster at resource D. It's like, well, where did it go in ROI? 
And that's sort of the point of the goal that Ellie wrote in 1986, and look at it, it's not any better. So, I want you to be very clear to take a look and answer those questions. These things conflict with each other. That's why we have a problem with a balanced scorecard. Although the whole idea of a balanced scorecard was to say it should balance, but then they got people actually trying to do it, so they would say, well, yours should be 22 and yours should be this. That doesn't work because it has to happen from an action. That's an end point. So tell me, what's the answer to those questions? Yes, 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 and yes. Why? Because they're interdependent. They're all the key components of return on investment. If they go the right way together, what happens to ROI? They go up. But if I put someone in charge of each one of them tactically, what happens? They hit heads, yes? And I start throwing bears over the fence. And what you have is, in fact, uh, Alan Bernard, are you in the room? Yeah, yes. Didn't you and Chad sort of come up with this cute slide ages ago? Yep. So this was a joint effort. See, we all were such an incestuous little TOC community. All right. So what's the impact of organizational conflicts on effectiveness and efficiency of the organization as a whole? Because you don't fly a plane by delivering a wing on time, right? You know, everything has to be there together. So if I want to improve productivity, which is my strategy, then I have protect and increase sales and reduce costs and in inventory. If those two things happen, what has to happen? Good things, yes? Okay. Those are like mother and apple pie. Who can argue with them? Now I have to do something to make them happen. I have to take an action. Now what I want you to see is I can take actions that focus here, or I can take actions that focus here. And depending on your definition of waste or where you focus, you get different results. But you guys get stuck between a rock and a hard place because sometimes you're asked to do both, yes? Okay. So you have a dilemma because sometimes if I take this action, it's the opposite action of that one. And so we compromise, and it's called a compromise because we get a compromised result, not because we're great statesmen and we came up with a brilliant solution. You compromised both of those necessary conditions to have that outcome. And when I do that, it gets bad. It gets so bad on one side, we all do what? Run over to the other side of the boat. And then it gets really bad, so we run over to the other side of the boat, and we end up with undesirable effects, and we oscillate up and down. Oh no, let's go over here. And so when a company doesn't know what to do, whenever I see somebody reorganizing, I say, well, there they didn't know what to do. And the last time they reorganized, they went to centrally managed. Now they've gone to decentrally managed. And now I've gone here. My have, you know, I'm not getting my projects out, so I should get my own resources. I know we call them people. And so I should get my own people, but that sounds like, like we should have an island, so I'm going to stay resources. And then I get my resources, and pretty soon you look up, and everybody has resources, and the company isn't making any money, and the executives yell, wait a minute, we'll put them together, because then the electricals can do what the electricals do and the mechanicals, but they can all share, okay? Then they put them together, and then my projects don't get out, yes? Okay, but I didn't solve the problem, did I? I just jumped from one side to the other. So whenever you see this, you know that there is something you could stand on the shoulder of some giant because we have something that hasn't been solved yet. Okay. Over that way. Okay. Let's talk about sources of variation. There are all the things we want to blame. These are, let's just say, our demand variability. And those are people outside our system boundary. Everybody in here can pick a system boundary. And if I were going to um, say we could tackle Intel, I would pick a system boundary of a division of Intel that is sustainable inside itself and doesn't borrow resources from anybody else. So you could probably pick a boundary, couldn't you? You could pick one, okay? Not the whole thing, but you can pick something that has a market outlet, something inlet, and its resources are inside of itself. Everybody wants to blame this. Everybody wants to blame this. My suppliers don't deliver on time, and my, my customers are crazy, and they never tell me they don't follow the forecast. I mean, what about that? These are process variations that are inherent in a process, and those are what you should be tackling with Six Sigma, some things like that. There's some good tools. But what we have is this big squiggly line coming down the middle, which is management variability. And what I'm going to say is the last slide is that. 
It's me jumping back and forth, taking actions that don't make any sense. And usually because I am attempting to satisfy those two competing laws. I have two competing laws, one a deep truth that is flawed, a fallacy, and one that is true, but I can't take the competition out. Now, Deming had a theory about, I didn't have a theory, he had a statement about that. And basically what he said is that self-induced variation is the worst kind and should be tackled first. Okay? If I take out management-induced variation, what happens to return on investment? It goes away, it goes big. I am going to make a claim to you that all we're doing in demand-driven is that. That is the major thing we are doing. There are there is a claim in all the research that the major cause of the bullwhip effect is forecast. We take that out also. So we get rid of forecast error, but I do not agree. And I haven't agreed from day one. I believe that the biggest um, cause of the bullwhip effect, and that's what I wrote in Demand Driven. In fact, all this material is in that book, Demand Driven, is caused by what we do to ourselves. So if you take out forecast and you take out Demand Driven, that's how you can get to 99% on time. Now. Is it easy? No. Is it doable? Very doable. Can it be done in months? Absolutely. Okay. So let's understand how we move to being a demand-driven system. We've got to unblock flow. So we start with diagramming each other's firefighting conflicts. Um, years ago in the old, and I'm going to say in my old um, view of how I would approach a people or a client, we wanted to teach everybody how to think like this. I don't do that anymore. You have a company to run. We think like this. We show it to you because everybody can understand Goldratt's thinking process when they see the outcome. Learning to do it in a disciplined manner all over the world in different environments is very difficult. That's why somebody else should do it. You lose people. You can do in three days an entire environment, what I'm going to show you about doing this. So you start with a logical diagram of conflict, which basically says I take everybody who is a direct report of a vice president, you don't talk to the vice presidents. You take the direct reports, the people who really live down in the dirt and oscillate back and forth because the vice president says, run over there and do that. Now run over here and do this. When we were working with Ditchwitch, we did the first day, and the CEO got very, very quiet. And he asked to meet him, us to meet him early in the morning, that next morning. So we got there about 15 minutes early, and we were looking for the core problem. And he walked up and he said, I'm, I have to tell you guys I know what the core problem is. We're like, okay, I'm thinking we're going to get thrown out of here. And he says, it's me. And I thought, okay, we're really going to be thrown out of here soon. And he puts down a memo, and the memo says, our escapement rate is crazy. It's through the roof. Our, um, let's see, our, what's the term for dollars you have to pay? Our rework, our warranty costs are going through the roof. From now on, job number one for everyone is nothing ships here that isn't 100% good. Three months later, he has another memo, and it says, our on-time delivery is in the toilet. From now on, everybody's job number one is to ship all day, every day of the week. Okay, now what, and he said, I just did this to the organization. And he said, I'm going to talk to them when they come in, and we're going to change. And we both went, oh, good, because we're not being thrown out of here. But that's a CEO who got it. You understand what I'm talking about? So we diagram these conflicts, and we start with that. So this is something, if you were to get my book, Measurement Nightmare, this is what was called, I developed this, it's called the Spiderweb Cloud. This is not the one in Measurement Nightmare. I made this special for you. It's the only custom slide we did for this workshop. Well, I did three, okay? And what I'm showing you is, see each one of those people's names? Each one of those is the person in charge of that area, okay? Each one of them has a firefighting conflict, and it goes like this. I spend my time doing this, putting out this fire. Let me check this little laser thing. Drop things and react to immediate issues, and I do that so I can be responsive to emergencies. What I'd rather do is stay on task and keep the work flowing. Do you understand the conflict? Now, these are both necessary conditions to maximize the company profit potential for his area, and he is spending his time up here when he'd rather be down here. So each one of these has a firefighting side and a what would I rather do. Now, notice I've got manufacturing engineering. This is R&D engineering, planning dilemma, accounting. So we have a supply chain from quote to cash. Does that make sense to you? This is an actual company. And I, I'm not going to tell you who they are because I don't have permission to use this work of theirs. I have permission to tell you about their results and things but, because I've done a case about that. 
But, um, so they're going to remain anonymous. But in Measurement Nightmare, I had something called um, the manager's conflict. And it basically said, here, I'm a plant manager, and I've got all these conflicts around me. But we're going to go with this. It's the same building of the tool. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Perfect. So now I'm going to go forward. And when I capture all those, here are all the firefights. If I just looked at the actions that people were taking, these are all the things that they're all complaining about. What we want to show them is we can probably boil these down to one system conflict and find a core conflict for this entire organization. And this was our root cause assessment. Our system and measures force us to manage the company through each project. So I must firefight each project. Okay. Now, you're just going to have to take my word for it that it boils down to this. If you were in my workshop yesterday, we did some work to show you. But this is, this is basically a very high-level synopsis of a day's worth of work. Okay. So what we really want to do is manage all the projects at a company level. We want to be a system. And the reason they said that they could see that is when they looked at what they really wanted to do, is if they could manage at a system level, all of the other side fit into that. So we ended up with putting this into what's called a logical diagram of conflict. This is just one. So we took all of that giant mass of everybody and we put them into a system that said, in order for me to maximize the company profit potential, I must, eat, let's see, I must protect each project's deliverable, both internal and external. These guys get, um, they do like the underground piping for Disney World, all right? They do the largest cool water facilities in uh, Dubai. They specialize in piping that moves either caustic, very cold, very hot, uh, through massive projects, okay? So it's not the piping in your bathroom. On this side, whoops, it says manage the potential profit, the maximize company profit potential. And in order to do that, I must protect my limited resources. And in order to protect my limited resources, I must manage the projects at a company system level, focus on the system. Now, I had a project management person who wrote their cloud yesterday. Where are they in? We used it as an example. Are you in here today? Are you in here? You so loved my workshop, you didn't come for the keynote? No, you blew his head up, so he didn't come back. Oh, okay. Well, that's all right. So anyway, the point is, is that we agreed that this fit right in here. Now, if you have centralized management or of, you're trying to get your projects through resources that are central, who have lots of other projects, yes? Anybody have that experience? So you're a project manager and you're trying to use resources that don't belong to you to get your projects done? Okay. The reason why you would put all those resources together is so that you don't, um, uh, you, you don't waste resource time because multiple projects, sometimes we have floods and starves, you know? Okay. When I live here, I jeopardize this. When I live here, I jeopardize this. So the whole idea is a good solution is going to have to solve both of those. So firefighting spirals, and look at it, went through accounting, went through everybody. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Okay, perfect. So a solution, in order for a solution to be good, it must protect both necessary conditions because both of those necessary conditions are essential. Okay. So here is the assumptions that kept them stuck. This is the assumptions about why is the glue of my logic good? What I'm looking for is are the assumptions valid? And if they're not valid, then I can't claim that that's a good place to be. So let's just look at this, okay? So this is, I want to move to managing projects with a company system focus level, and they came up with all these reasons why this would be a good thing to do. So if you look through those, I'm not going to read them to you. Do they make sense to you, and could you feel them in your own world that if that were possible, it would be a good thing? And they got it. They said, yeah, if we could do that, we could get all these wonderful things. The real key is right here. Okay. When I went to visit them, I, what I do with a company is I have them fill these things out. Then I have them fill out some data templates for me. So um, you are adults. At least I think you are, right? Okay. You are adults. And the bad thing about being an adult is you don't learn in theory. 
You only learn in practice. Very few adults have, we've lost the capacity as an adult to learn in theory, other than me because I'm not well and I'm not employable and I am terminally curious and once I know something I don't care anymore and I really don't want to write about it and tell you about it, but I seem to have to or I can't make a living. So, I, I can learn in theory, in fact I like it, but I have to go practice it to really learn. If you guys have a job, don't you want to see the theory applied in your world so you can learn the principles in your real world? So we take your data and we make data sets and we actually build you a model of the whole demand driven. Then we teach in four days from that model. That's the only way, I mean, so we can get something done really fast. People can't grasp concepts that are abstract as well as they can if you bring it in and say, yeah, that's my project or my product or that's how my customers behave. Does that make sense? Okay, so we put that together and we already have a pretty good idea when we walk in. Then I go make a, a visit and everybody always wants to show me their world. So they want to walk me through their plant. Okay, I will walk through your plant. I know your plant already, but I will walk through the plant. The thing that was fascinating about these guys is they're down in Tennessee and they have all of these um, semi-containers scattered all over. They're just scattered all over. And I said, you know, what's with this? He said, well, we have to rent the containers, and sometimes it takes us up to 14 days to load a truck to drive out of here. Now, they have contracts where the truck has to arrive on the construction site at least a week ahead of time in sequence of what you're going to build because it builds around different things. Does that make sense to everybody? But how you load the truck is critical because some things are 40 feet, some things are this, other things are little, it'll crunch, it'll destroy it. So it is actually a truck builder. It's a bill of material to load the truck. I have child parts that have to be there first in order to load the truck in the right sequence. Does that make sense to everybody? Do you understand what I'm saying? So this is their, they, because things are coming out of the plant in very different speeds, it can take them, they are spending all this money with these containers and moving them all around. Now, that's a definition. What do you think about that for flow? Bad. Okay. We're going to come back to that. I want you to keep that in your mind because we're going we're to look for a metric that said, did they succeed with flow? On the other side, they're stuck here because these are the assumptions they have. Now, look for false assumptions. I agree that every project has some unique quantities, but a cookie cutter approach won't work here. That's not true. A template approach will work. The only existing med metric that we have um, is a project metric. This is interesting. We don't produce standard products. That's really not true. They're all different, but they're standard to some level. Number eight is wrong. Dead wrong, if you know anything about managing projects. Nine is dead wrong. It's all costing. Eleven is my favorite. Why do we really stay stuck? Okay. And it took them a long time to get to that one. Okay. So now with getting this out, we have one more cloud we have to look at. Why do I stay jumping back and forth between these? And this is their world. They're very seasonal. They get, um, they get penalties on some of their jobs if, they're not, if they don't deliver. So when that happens, that's what this means when it says, um, we make special commitments that override the schedule. Anybody who's got a, a contract that has penalties, guess where they go? To the top, okay? So this is just kind of an, a, an, instruction, an instructive plate about why we're stuck here. Okay. Does this make sense to everybody? This is their world described by them. So once we understand that and we have a solution direction, this is what our task was. Create a system that visibly connects the task due dates, the status and priorities in the project build schedules to the rest of the supply chain for determining and agreeing on work priorities. If you could do that, would you be happy? So step two is become demand driven. So I'm going to let Carol take you through the steps to becoming demand driven, then we're going to come back and we're going to do them with this company. Great. Thanks, Deb. So how do we become demand driven? And remember, what's that definition? Go back to the definition. The ability to sense changes and adapt. All right, that's demand driven. So all the other marketing out there that you may see about, oh, it's just a better forecast. No. 
It's about how do I sense and adapt. So first is how do we embrace flow? The second step is, is how do we then design a demand-driven operating model? All right, this is not a master schedule. This is a capability that allows my organization to be able to sense what's changing out there and adapt. The third is, is then now how do I protect those decoupling points? Because what do we got coming at us? We've got variability. What's the only way to mitigate variability? Are we going to eliminate it and live in a perfect world? I don't care even if you get to a Six Sigma quality. Is it perfect quality? No, it's still 3.4 chances per million opportunities that something's going to go wrong. So we know that waves are coming at us. How do we do it? Now, it's just like in a marina. You put a break wall around the marina. We have to be able to absorb variability. That absorption has to handle from both sides because they're being hit from variability from both sides. And then finally, how do we bring that model to the organization? So as we look at how do we get this thing to go, come on. I'm pointing the right way, honest. Maybe I'm blocking it. I don't know. You broke it. <laughs> it's all your fault. Okay, no. All right, so let's look. Here's Plossel's Law. All right, we've already discussed that. We've already looked at the definitions of flow, cash velocity, and net profit divided by investment. All right, so we've talked about that. We talked about the missing link is that it is the visibility the clicker. Clicker. It's the missing link. The missing there link. There we go. All right. So we've talked about that the core conflict area is this idea that we have to have relevant visibility so that we can mitigate variability. And what is visibility? Visibility is defined as relevant information for decision making. This is not about more data. It's about using relevant information. And variability is clearly defined as the summation of the differences between what we thought was going to happen and what actually happens. Because we're not living in a Newtonian perfect world. So demand driven and establishing that model is about following the right rules. We're living in a different world with different rules. You know, you're not playing with a fickle four year old that can change the rules. It's a different set of rules. We're living in a complex adaptive system, and it's not going to go Newtonian anytime soon. All right? It is all about this complex adaptive system. So what we've got is that our demand-driven model is based around this improvement of variability uh, that we can get through visibility. So let's look at the steps into creating this demand-driven model. Well, the first step is, is we have to create a map. Just as we talked about in the complex adaptive systems, can only be understood by mapping the dependencies and the interconnectedness. Now, the next is, is we have to create short, independent horizons. All right, so because trying to manage that whole thing, what do we know? The more things we couple together, the more damaging that variability is. Then the next step is, is then how do we establish these strategic control points, these leverage points, not necessarily at a bottleneck. Where is it that these strategic control points then govern and leverage the entire system output? This is not breaking it up into little pieces that we're going to manage each piece, hopefully improve each piece and add it back up to the whole. It's about putting the levers in the, rest, the right spot so that we can affect the whole. And then finally, how the buffers use Pareto. Now, we've all heard of the 80-20 rule, right? Except in complex adaptive systems, it's more like 99-1. All right, so Pareto analysis, where we're looking at the tails to then determine and figure out how to get those leverage points to get to signal action, to signal priority, and to signal opportunity. That's a demand-driven model. And the last step here is, is that how do we get the visible buffer and control point status, also using this Pareto analysis of focusing on the tails. So here's another giant that this whole process stands on, is this giant of Six Sigma with Deming right, and Shuhart and all the guys out of the quality area, because it's very much in your area, but how many times as a black belt you've done projects, the ROI hasn't improved. It isn't about how many black belt projects you do, it's how have these black belt projects focused on 
the elimination of these variability points then leads to return on investment. So I'm going to turn it over to Deb, and she's going to take you through the So let's case. build one of these. So if, if we just go back for a second um, to this slide, what I really want you to think about is that these are the steps to build a demand-driven system. So we're going to build with them. If you don't build it with these rules, you don't have smart metrics. Because I don't have it. I mean, people call me. I have people say, oh, could you just tell us what the good measures are? because it will just change our measures, and then it will all be OK. It's like, well, you know, you should measure ROI. We already do that. I said, well, then you don't need me. That's smart. That's smart. But <clears throat> let's go here. This is uh, the company we were just talking about. And basically what we have is they have um, engineering, let's see, uh, estimating. We'll get a request from a customer for a quote. They basically will turn it around, and they have to have both operations and engineering and manufacturing engineering take a look at it, and they then send it back to the customer. The, uh, the heavy design is done. The design of what the, it has to do is done by the customer. It's the, um, the tricky stuff about how to deal with those, you know, the kind of fluids that are going through or the couplings or the pumping things. Those are the stuff that they do, all right? So the big schematic that says this is going to go from here around this tree and over to there is already given to them. So if they took the thing apart and they really looked at it, even though some of these projects can go for you know, two years, three years, some of them can go for two to three months, they could break it down to, I could probably do each task in a week, two weeks, two to three weeks. Okay? But when I looked at it, they actually ended up with a three to five month process to get it to the where they could ship that first truckload. Now that's interesting, don't you think? Okay. So what's happening? Now that's just breaking the task time. If I just did the tasks. Now that's the same thing as if I were to go out to manufacturing and if you look at wait time versus task time, it's about 7% to 93% and the 93% is not the task time. Okay. So what they're doing here, whoops, I didn't want to do that. Uh, what they're doing here is, I thought I was hitting the laser. Here is one segment of the business. When they, what we did is we put all of these projects into six templates. And those six templates were defined by how long and what kind of resources they would take in engineering to get through here back to the customer and then release to manufacturing. Then we also put them into a template that said, if I looked at this kind of project, what kind of resources would it use in manufacturing? And that would give manufacturing an idea of what kind of projects are in the queue waiting to be um, submitted for an estimate to back to the customer because they're trying to give them an idea of what kind of capacity will I need four months from now, six months from now. So it's kind of a rough cut capacity planner. Does that make sense to everybody? This is how many projects I have in estimating. This is how many projects I have that have been accepted and are, are now back in customer approval. This is how many projects and I can kind of see what it's looking like in my, um, my capacity world. So I have three distinct things that are happening. So this is the flow that we did for them. All right, and This is a very high level flow. And basically what I have is a nonlinear systems being mapped by the interdependencies and the connections. So I have an RFQ estimating, drawing. It gets, I'm managing customer view. This is actual process. This is where the project manager lives. He lives here. It goes out to the customer and comes back in. If the customer doesn't bring it back in on time, guess what happens? Okay. Everybody's expecting the first truckload, the promise to this market, the strategic market promise is six weeks. So from the time I get it into operations, I should get it out in six weeks. Okay. Then I have contract administration. As soon as they say it's OK, customer approval for release, release the plant to the plant, and then receive it operations. So I have a break here between boundaries in my system. This is in Chicago. This is in Tennessee. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Then I receive it at operations. I have to do manufacturing engineering so that I can get bombs because you can't build off of a design engineering drawing. Everybody knows that, right? In fact, the manufacturing engineering often takes longer than the design engineering. I have long lead time purchase parts. I also have short lead time purchase parts. And here is where I start to get capacity scheduling. 
This is where they say, I have a bomb, I have a standard, I know what I'm going to do, and now I can actually look at, can I schedule it to start in the plant? I cut it, I fabricate it, I coat it, I test it, I kit load and build it. Remember I talked to you, it has to be, it's a kit load. It has to be in that order, so it has to arrive in that order. So we actually built bills of materials that included this as a parent part. The build order was a parent part. So the truck was a parent part. So you can think of it as a load builder. Does that make sense? So it was one of the things we had to add to the system. So look at that. Actual couple lead time is three to five months. Should be six weeks with just half time. Everybody understand how that bulb up effect is happening? All right. So decoupling points. These are used to make independent horizons. And in most people think of them as stock decoupling points. If I put, uh, I have raw materials so my supplier doesn't bother me, okay? I have intermediate components to separate cutting and fabrication from assembly. I have finished goods to separate my variation from servicing my customer. Everybody understands that? That's what we usually think of. But in my world and in the world of complex adaptive systems, they are always about signals and boundaries. So it's a handoff between areas. So I want to decouple one area's variation from hitting me, okay? So decoupling points can also be stock positions, which is where we get into DDMRP, which is not reorder points and is not safety stock. You'll have to read about that on your own. And, but it also can be a strategic time buffer. All buffers are time. Stock is stored time of your factory or your vendor's factory. It's just stored time. Sprint capacity, like Dell put in at, op, at assembly, because they never thought they are going to do 400 computers in a day or 10. Sprint capacity is stored time of people, right? Okay. So a time buffer as an insertion in the routing or the tasks, dependent tasks, that I take and I put it there and I say, I'm going to put it there like a seawall so that all the variation can be accounted for in one place. So you only get touch time cure time, setup time, or task time, and we cut all your stuff in half, nobody likes it, your standards go this big, and we put it someplace where we can manage it, look at it, and deal with it. We can also measure it and make it visible, okay? So that's what a decoupling point means. The benefits of decoupling points is that the customer experiences a shorter lead time. Now, if I am manufacturing engineering and design engineering is I am their customer, I'm going to experience a shorter lead time. If the plant is, exper is expecting everybody to get everything to them, they're going to experience a shorter lead time. And that goes for the customer too. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so here is what we did. We created short independent planning horizons to stop that cascading effect. Because I am never going to release something here if it hasn't, I, I, it's like a time buffer, I'm ticking it down. We do something kind of weird in my world in 1990, probably 98, 97, I did not like the way that buffers were defined uh, at all in TOC. I don't agree with them and it's because you couldn't measure. I didn't understand why until I started reading about complex adaptive systems and that that has only been out since about 2005, and only is there writing or research that was done in supply chains using complex adaptive systems since about 2008. So this is relatively new stuff. What you get by putting a time buffer in these places is you get visibility, and then you can measure and you can align things. If you put a long buffer against the whole thing at the end, you lose that. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's, I didn't know why we did it. I knew it worked. It just didn't, it made sense to me because it's always been about measures. So what this is, is we use a 10 zone buffer. You'll see it better in the future. On the top is it's not here yet, yet to be received. Early, green, yellow, red, dark red is late. Down here is it's in the buffer and it's ready for you. So yet to be received, not here yet. The yet to be received tells me the status of everybody feeding the buffer. The yet to be received also tells me who's not on task. The yet to be received also gives each one of these people their priority. This, whatever work or task or project or order is farthest along in here is the priority for every single one of these feeding resources. And they all have the same priority and it's visible to them. Does that make sense to you? The received portion tells me how well protected this is in terms of hitting the due date out to the customer or back to the customer. So I'm basically making an independent planning horizon here. Now notice I have one going out to the customer and coming back. 
another independent planning horizon because I need to control what the customer is doing and say, hey, you need to focus on this because if you want to keep your, your um, promise date that we talked about, you have to get it back to me on this time. There's also a handoff between here. When we wrote that template, you said you wanted it. If you don't get it to me in order to do the manufacturing engineering, then those projects aren't going to be available on time. The other thing that happens is it tells me exactly how much work is in the queue so I can have a visibility of what's coming to me and what priority and what resources I have to free up or where I'm going to be using it. Does that make sense to everybody? Do you understand how we're making short independent horizons? I don't plan this work. I don't plan any work in there until I know I have that because I don't schedule or waste that resource. They'll go on to something else. They'll go on to something that's a less priority because I'm going to keep them working on the next highest priority if you're not in time. Do you understand what we're doing? Okay. So that's how I create short independent planning horizons. Now look what happens is I get these manageable times and this is really where we ended up. Pretty cool. So that became their cycle time. That became their lead times. That became what they could manage to and that became their results. Breaking variation, yes? Okay. So we simplify complex systems by knowing where to impose control. So a control point is a place that I choose and I pick to put in between decoupled points to gain control or schedule of an environment. They direct all of the other resources. So how do we choose control points? Exit and entry from any system boundary critical because I have to have whoever the adaptive agent is receiving the signal has to know it's come in and I need to know that it's there and I need to know that you're interpreting it correctly. Okay? The second thing is divergent points or convergent points. So if things are, I need five things coming in to be assembled, I need to know that they're all there. Okay? So I want some sort of control over making certain that they're all there or they're going out. Points of scarce capacity, that would be um, a bottleneck, okay? Or something that I think is precious. If I don't have a bottleneck in an environment, I'm going to pick something in the middle because in the middle gives me an idea that says, if I schedule from here and I keep visibility here, if it's on time, the system's on time. So if your control points are on time, your system is on time. And you only have to look at those. When we did Laterno, we had a million and a half square feet of manufacturing and fabrication space, including a full steel mill that was like down the block because it's like acres. We did it from seven control points, okay? And they made all their own electronics. So we're not talking about a lot. And if we have something with notorious instability, if you ever read about the Oregon freeze-dry case, um, Freeze drying is an incredible process. And you make it a control point because that forces you to gain control over it. Right? So if you take a look at these, the drum is, drum is also a pace setter. So drum is a TOC term. Pace setter would be a lean term. But it is the place where I am going to schedule from because it's the place that has the least amount of capacity. So I want to be certain that I finitely schedule it. The reason I'm doing a finite schedule is if you pour water into that glass, you can only drink as much as you pour in. If you keep pouring, you're not going to get to drink it anyway. Does that make sense? So we finite schedule one place. APS, Advanced Planning Systems, finite schedule everything, and then they reschedule them every hour or every day or whenever you do it. And it's like just take all your work and throw it up in the air and create variation. Um, it's insane. And in fact, when APS entered that ROI chart, it went down. So I would suggest not adopting that, but you can do what you like. Drums are a critical control point, and, and control points are critical control points. The only difference is one's a capacity scheduler. They are not more important than the others. Okay? So here we have a drum at drawing because I have some scarce skill sets in drawing that I have to be sure that I don't take... I need to look at the kinds of templates in that project and say, you know, when can I really get this in and out? Why? Because I want an executable schedule. Today, you just push things into your project people. They multitask. Somebody screams. You move things around. You do all this kind of waste, and you wonder why nothing comes out. Same thing's true with manufacturing products. There is no difference between products and projects. I, I said that in the late 90s. I took a lot of crap for it. And um, I'm going to say again, there is no difference. It has the exact same rules. You may have a little bit different tool set tweak in the software. If you have very long projects, 
You're going to need a different type of software. If it's short, I can use the same type of software that we're talking about here because it's about um, the time of and the amount of variation you're going to have. But that's all I'm going to say about that. So I have control points. I have drums. And now I'm going to have to figure out how to protect them. So what have I done? I'm using the lever point phenomena. From very few small places, I am gaining control of the entire system. I'm also going to gain visibility. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to dampen variation at each one of those control points, and I'm going to do it with one of these buffers. So stock and time, all of these are just stored time. All they're there to do is break variation. And I have people say, oh my gosh, you're going to put these insertions of time into the routing, and then our times are going to expand. No, it's not, because I'm going to take out all the fluff that you made. Did you ever do a task project with people, and you say, OK, how long are those tasks going to take you? And they give you this thing, and they say, well, it's actually nine hours, but it's going to take me two weeks. Okay. Well, why is it going to take you two weeks? Because they know they're not going to be able to stay on task, right? So what we do instead is we say, you can have the nine hours, and we're going to put a buffer behind it to absorb the variation we know is going to happen. But we're going to keep you on task, because we're not going to multitask you. That is choking whip in projects, the same as choking whip in products. Does everybody understand? Okay. That's why I say there's no difference. So this is a 10-zone buffer board that I talked to you about previously. Okay. What we do is this is early. So it means it's been released. It's coming through the pipeline. But it's not due yet. I put a time hour buffer. This one's nine. So each one of these is three zones. We do not have equal zones in stock buffers. Equal, stock buffers have very different zone sizes for, because they have very different math. But for this, this is good enough. So green says we're OK. Yellow, if it's not here, is it going to be here? Red, I may choose to act or not. Okay. Late means you miss the time you should have started at my control point, because the control point governs the schedule. Up here is yet to be received. All feeding resources are tracked through here. Down here is how much protection is there in front of my control point or my drum in order for me to stay working consistently. I don't want to starve it. I don't want flood starve. I want nice, steady flow. Make sense to everybody? Okay. What happens is, we, whoops, oh, I hit that That's button. That they told me button. not to hit. Yeah. OK, work orders or a project order comes through. When it is received, it's time stamped. So I know exactly what zone it came in. That will be important later. Does everybody understand why I'm using a 10 zone buffer, the purpose of it? OK. We track and trend occurrences in the tails of the buffer, both tails. I want to know just as many reasons why something got released early as I want to know why it ended up late. Released early tells me I have task time that I can compress, routings that I can compress, and I can actually reduce my cycle time. So I get a lot of cycle time reduction by tracking those earlies and going after whatever the standard is or the issue that I didn't understand. So this is what it looks like for this little world. Time buffers. Okay. And notice I do have a stock buffer right here. They swore up and down that their projects were all unique. When we went through and looked at their materials, there were about mm, 20 different items that were used on about 70% of all jobs. And by stocking those, we didn't have any lead time issues. Does that make sense? Okay. People think that they're unique, but they're really not. Capacity buffers are also critical. So a capacity buffer simply says, I need sprintability. So when variation happens to me, I can recover. Time buffers and capacity buffers are interconnected. If you have lots of variation, you have a choice. If the feeding resources have sprint capability, then I need a smaller time buffer. The less sprint capability in a resource, the bigger the time buffer. Yes? OK. So I want you to see that I just showed you. I just showed you an engineer to order. I'm going the wrong way. I showed you an engineer to order. Do not think this is cookie cutter. It is not. This is where thought work comes in. This is the tricky part, the design. This is a fast-moving consumer good product. Notice they have plenty of capacity. You don't see any drums, OK? Um, this is a distribution centers to um, a hub, to a pack, to a mix and blend. All of these are broken with uh, strategic stock buffers, right? 
This one is a make to order, make to, no, I'm sorry, this is an assemble to order plant. So notice there is no finished goods. And what we're doing here is we are protecting stock with um, our vendors. We have cuttings, we have weldings, fabric, uh, uh, machining, we have outsource operations. So I'm going out, I have a buffer with a boundary, that's a control point, ent entering and exiting a system. And um, the strategic market lead time is one week because everybody else in the market is at three weeks. I can master the market without putting any finished goods in and still be competitively good. Does that make sense to everybody? So where I put stock is dependent on what my market lead time promise is. What's my strategy? You don't just... Strategic stock means it does something for me. That's why I invest in it. I don't just stuff inventory somewhere and call it a strategy. So when we don't deliver on time and sales says, well, we really need some of those because we, you know, so pretty soon we have something of everything, right? Okay, why don't we just deliver on time and then we don't need something of everything? So the point I wanted to show you is they're all over the map. This is one that is, uh, just went live last week. This is, um, I'm going to be able to say their name because I got their permission. This is Wurtzia. They make, um, they do ship building things. And what this is, is this is their plant in Pool UK. And they do uh, wastewater systems, ballast, um, uh, ballast systems. 90% of all ships sailing in the world have these systems in them. That's what I know. Now, I designed this system, but I don't really know what that stuff does. Okay. Does, I don't need to know what that stuff does. Okay. So what we have, and I'm going to show you how demand-driven works. I get a request from the customer. It generates a work order. We capacity test that work order against this drum, okay? When we went in there, they had their own machining, and their machining was like 1950s. And they were talking about outsourcing it. And I said, well, let's look at it first, because maybe we can save this thing. But they have machining centers that they own also in the UK. And it, it was hopeless. And it wasn't that they couldn't get the precision. It was that these guys are all retiring, and there's nobody who can do it. There's nobody who can run this equipment to that precision because they are craftsmen. So they had to, we had to let it go, all right? Because normally I, I choose not to do that. I wanted to look at it first, but totally had to agree. We send back a promise date to the customer that said, we capacity tested this. This is the date you asked for. This is the date we can ship it, and we know we will hit it, okay? Then we release a work order. Do you understand why I'm calling this demand-driven? I get an order. I capacity test. I send a promise date that says, yeah, I'm going to build something now, all right? Then I kit all of the parts that need to go, all the by parts, all the subcomponent by parts, which are going to come out of here, and my assembled subcomponents. So assemblies go through here and get rebuilt, all right? And then I ship it out to the customer, the little red dot. Okay, I got that way. I also sell spares because this is a global business for ships all over the world and they're reconditioning these things. So spares goes out. And when that happens, I have a real-time lead, uh, R plus lead time, which determines the size that buffer has to be. So how much inventory do I need? I need enough inventory to cover the time to reliably replenish, which is right there, over the number of pulls I think I will get on an average usage. So if it's five days to build it, then in five days I'm going to get 100 pulls. I should have 500. Does that make sense? Five a day? That's just basic math. There are lots of other little tweaks in it, but there is math that says I am not building to forecast. I am building because you took something out and I'm going to put it back. Does that make sense? So I say we're decoupling forecast. We use forecast maybe to determine the average, to size those, and then we use future or past, but we don't build to forecast, and that's the demand part of it. Because I've pulled something out, I generate a work order that says, hey, you know, this is now in a zone, you better build me some. So I generate a work order, and I build another one, and it goes up there. So now I have this cycle of replenishment. Everybody understand? Now, because I've pulled subcomponents out of here, I need to buy more, and so I generate a purchase order. That purchase order has a reliable lead time to make it across here that includes the transport time, which dictates the sizing of these buffers, okay? 
Because I've used more buy parts, I have to issue some purchase orders. And one of the things that was really interesting is when we did this, we said to them, you're going to want to control those buy parts. You're going to want to bring them in, kit them, and ship them to your um, outsource machine shop. And they said, oh, no, we don't want to do that. That'll be their problem. That's why we outsource. It'll be their problem. They'll have to deal with that. And I said, then you're going to die. Because they have their own things they're running through their machine shops for their own division. What priority do you think you're going to get? And they said, good point. Why don't we make certain they have what we need when we send it to them? So we controlled that system by putting the visibility, we extended the system out to where they are, and we can see it remotely, and we manage it from here. So some of the parts are brought in and shipped here and kitted, and some are shipped directly like the forgings that are done in Italy. Now do you understand why I call it a demand-driven system? Okay. Do you understand that we have visibility across the supply chain anywhere in the world, it's all web-based, and I can see the status of every strategic stock, every work order, is it on time, is it not on time, and what is it happening? and the stats and the buffer. And that is a demand-driven variation map. That is a really cool one. Um, we're going to do a case study uh, together with Wartzia in, uh, I think, September, um, talking about new things that are new. So let's talk about deploying the operating model. I just built one. Now, until I build one and I deploy it, I don't have smart metrics. Because smart metrics are an outcome of visibility to relevant information of flow across the supply chain. Okay? So if you don't, ha you, can't, you can't get it if you don't build it doing these. Then you can start with smart metrics. Okay. Make sense? Okay. So deploying smart metrics. There are six objectives to smart metrics. And when I put this together, I had some help. Chad, Chad's pretty amazing. I'll say that in the book, Chad had a lot to do with this. I kept talking about, well, this is what it is. He said, well, can't you just distill it down to what is each one of them doing? And I thought, well, no. He said, well, then I will. So what we did is we broke it into day-to-day -day tactical operations for control. That part I knew. But the metric objective is, what do you want a system to do? I want the system to deliver reliably. Yes? If it delivers reliably, it's because it's stable. So I'm looking for system stability. And I'm looking for system speed and velocity. So when we came down to those three things, we don't really need anything else. Every single metric that we have fits into those categories. So what's the message? If you're going to put a metric out, you have to have an objective, and you want to have a message of who's ever reading the metric. So the message that you're getting from reliability is execute to the plan, schedule, market expectation. Now it's coming from the back end. Execute to the market expectation, the schedule, and the plan. So I, does everybody understand why I'm saying it's coming backwards? But then I'm flowing forwards because it's demand driven. And now I'm flowing this way with information and materials. System stability, once I start executing, or once I have already put something out there to work on, I want to be certain that every single link in the chain passes on as little variation as possible. That's your job. Okay? And the third one is pass the right work on as fast as possible. So go as fast as you need to go to make sure you still have quality, but be speedy. So all of those are tactical, and we don't have time to talk about anything on the bottom today except system improvement and waste because that fits in. So I'm going to finish up with this one, and I want to show you that in the system that we built for this company, these are their visibility points. This is what, this, at each of these visibility points, this is what they get to see. At all controls and drums, they have time buffers, so they know exactly if they're on schedule or not, who's not on schedule, where the work is, and when it came in. At every single stock buffer, they have a status of stock. We have something called prioritize share now. For all of the work orders that get generated to be run across this drum, the drum is finitely scheduled. So here is a resource load graph that shows you I'm never going to schedule it above that 100%. Does everybody understand? How far out it is scheduled with no gap tells me what my lead time has to be to promise the market. I cannot promise less than five days in this market. Does, do you see that? Because I don't have a gap sooner than that. So if I have a lead time that's being promised 
So sales can be looking at this and very clearly see, I can't promise you sooner than five days. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. So I'm connecting everybody to everybody. Because I'm finitely scheduling, it's very clear that what, goes, what gets first shot at the schedule, what you see that's blue here, and this is light gray, this means it's a released order. The floor has permission to work on it. I only release one to two days in Horizon. Why? Because if I have a stock environment that I'm building to, I'm making something here, I'm kidding these, I want to be certain that the highest priority of these gets first shot at that drum. So every day it reschedules things that are in the priority queue. Why? Because every day somebody's pulling something out of stock, so something that was green yesterday could go down to a red zone today. Do you understand? And it, the other one stayed yellow. So we actually take and make maximum order quantities so that the green zone is, the, so that the, let me put it this way. So this, if you're down here in stock status, I only have a maximum order quantity to take you up to that stock status to take you up to that stock status. So I may have three work orders in here for that kit of 100, 100, and 100. Make sense? That means any stock that has um, any item that is in a red zone will get first shot at the first day's opportunity on that drum. Then I'll do the yellow, then I'll do the green. That's called prioritize share so that I keep all of those kits in the same place. If I'm a make-to-order environment, I'm going to do it by you get shot if your day to start is in the past or today. If your day to start is in the future, you're in the green zone and we won't, we won't schedule you unless we have nothing else to do. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So I'm giving the very best uh, priority actually built into the schedule. That's pretty new and it's pretty cool. I can tell I'm boring you. I'm really <laughs> proud of it. Uh, I love it. So every single one of these are now in execution. Each of them has a schedule. The drum, it's a backward schedule. The drum is scheduled based on if it takes two days to get to here, then two days from when it's going to ship. If this is going to ship on the 12th, I must be through here by the 10th. If these guys take five days to feed me, I must start them on the 5th. Okay? That's called a rope. And... This is available real time for everybody to see how everybody's doing. So everybody's a priority is aligned to hitting that due date or making certain that that stock is refilled at the highest priority. Any, we're going to come back to any questions. You have any questions on it later? But that are, those are the tools. So first we talked about the rules, right? You can build a system with the rules, but if you don't have the tools to feed it, you can't get smart metrics. So first do the rules. Then build your tools. Great. Thanks, Deb. Yeah. As you can probably tell, there's a lot more depth under here. And <laughs> yeah, we got our favorite things we like to. So let's wrap up and so we can get to your questions. Now, the next one is system reliability. We've got the rules. We've got the tools. Now, how are we going to measure that our system's reliable? All right, as Deb said, with the drum, you know, what are some of the metrics that we're going to look at? If we're going to be looking at whoops, stock buffers, oh, whoops. I thought somebody fell off of that. Okay, that wasn't me. Deb didn't fall off the stage, did she? No, I didn't. No. <laughs> how are we going to monitor these stock buffers? Then how is it that we're going to look at the metrics on the control points? All right, rules, tools. We've got the design. Now we've got the measures. So how about that? Are we going to look at system stability? All right, what measure? We're looking to pass as little variation as possible. Measures for stock, measures for time buffers, We've got the 10 zone buffer boards. How is it that we manage uh, the drum? All right, so how do we monitor? And it, it, pretty typical people say, well, what are the smart measures? We'll just Im implement them. No, we've got to take care of the rules, the tools, uh, get the design done. Then velocity. How do we pass the right work on as fast as possible? Deb went through this in the design that she did. How do we measure where things are coming in too early? If they're persistently coming in too early, then that tells you you've got capacity upstream that you may not even be aware of that you had. Because you're working on the wrong, wrong thing, thing first. Right. Uh, how do we improve our demand-driven model? How do we take a look at and tie this back to the strategic side? All right, what are the new opportunities that I have as a company to be able to go after different kind of business? 
This is not just about production. All right, this is not just about a one way. This is a bi-directional learning from what our strategy is and then feeding back to a strategy what is now possible. All right, and this is a great quote. Systems with good adaptive mechanisms continue to, mo to innovate. This is more of a mechanism of exploration than exploitation. How do we explore different markets? How do we get into whole different things that we didn't even think about getting into. It's on its own. So, I know, I just I had that same experience. So what are the six steps? Well, the six steps first is we've got to get the data. You know, capture the occurrence, convert them to control charts. So for all those Six Sigma guys in here, plug into this. Leverage all the good stuff you're doing already. All right, that's the key. This is not about, well, forget about MRP or forget about TOC or forget about Lean or forget about Six Sigma. This is about how do I stand on the shoulders of giants? How do I go back to what I've done well and take it to our next step? But you can't capture the data of your favorite pet project. That's you capture correct. the data of these smart metric control points because they leverage your ROI. Right. It should take the fight out of what's the right thing to do. And that's the thought work. So step one. This is collecting the data. And where are we going to focus? Not in the center of the distribution. We're going to focus in the tails. Because what are we after? All buffers use the Pareto model. Right? We're looking at the things that are out in the tails. So we're looking where things are coming in early. Where are things coming in late that are impeding our demand-driven model? Then we convert it to distribution and control charts. Use all this wonderful education that you've got but with that different framework, with that different demand-driven model. How do we focus on improving flow? As I push the tails, I improve flow. And then trending performance over time. This is not about how did I just do today, how am I doing overall? How is my trend running? Are things getting better? Are things getting worse? How can I prioritize and direct it? Because I have to make my model adaptive. This is not a one and done. Right, this is not model it and never touch it again. This is constantly adapting it based on what the market forces are, what our customers are expecting, uh, how we've been able to perform to the market, what our competition is doing. Right, and we're looking at those outlier events. Now that would be true for stock, but in all the rest of these, you are getting the signals about how to um, remodel yourself. Okay? Absolutely. So, so there's, you know, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And then convert opportunities. How do we assign actions? How do we address those things that are going to generate ROI? They're going to generate ROI if we address the outliers, which then improve flow. And as we improve flow, it ties directly to return on investment. As Deb said, not your favorite project. All right. So how can we do a Pareto analysis here? How do we do a cause and what is the effective? We might be able to use a dollarized Pareto here. We might have one thing that happens only a couple times, but every time it does, it's catastrophic. We need to solve that problem. Getting people engaged. This is about people. When you provide people with relevant visibility, they will self-organize to act in such a way that benefits the company in its competitive position for sustainable success. But I want to say one thing about that slide. Oh, right. Okay. Um, you all stood up as leaders, yes? Okay, the point of this slide is assign action. This is about accountability. You can put this system in, but if you don't change the questions you ask as leaders, as managers, and you do not assign and then follow up, this is the feedback loop. So if you read the second, if you read the book, it's you have got to have a sustainable feedback loop. If you put this in, you will get this good, and then if you don't do anything, you won't get any better. Okay, so it is about the feedback loop. It's all there but you have to hold people accountable. And it takes, people have to get used to being held accountable in an organization where everybody can skate because blame goes like this. This is, a, this is the hard one. So it is up to the management and the leaders. And, and I'll, to be honest with you, we, nev we never got there with Unilever because we never got to the top. So they have a great system and it works beautifully for them, but at the end of every year, they trash their buffers and don't bring in any stock because the, the bonuses of the executives are tied to driving that inventory down. Then they don't ship anything in January and they do it every year. Now, do they love this? They are getting great results from it. They love it, but they haven't, it, they're huge. They're kind of, I don't have access to that kind of, uh, they're 
It's like $70 billion. I do not have access to the top to change that. In all the rest of my clients, I do. It is that accountability that has to come from you wherever you are in the organization. Does that make sense? I really want to stress that. So it's all about confirming this actions and accountability to improve the trend. We move from bimodal, right, where we're oscillating, and what happens is, is we start to move to a single distribution, and then we continue to push on the tails of that distribution so that what we get is we get enablement of results. We get uh, wrong animation. <laughs> yeah, we got a wrong animation. Yes. We got to the but end. But you got the idea. Well, it's like begin with the end in mind. I'm so, okay, sorry. Okay, so it's my correct. Problem, the animation. <laughs> Good job. All right. That's very adaptive. We are adaptive. <laughs> and then what do we want to do? We have to tighten the specifications. Because as we start to push the tails, all right, then what we need to do is tighten the specification of the models and go back through and remodel. What is now possible? Because right, remember, a nonlinear system cannot be optimized by definition. But who right? cares? Because you can get better and better, better and, and better. better. Forever. I came out of large software, and to me, I, I was a vice president of PeopleSoft. APO is the worst thing ever perpetrated by the software industry onto companies around the world. Do you have an opinion on that? No. <laughs> Every time I do that, Chad just goes, and I go, I'm old enough, I can, <laughs> I can hold an opinion. That's what I tell him, too. And the reality, the reality is, is because nonlinear systems can't be optimized. But, as Deb said, but they can continually learn. They continually change, they continually improve, and they continually emerge to a higher order. And we do it over again and over again. And if over they use smart metrics. If Only if you use you smart metrics. You have metrics. implemented smart metrics to make it sustainable. Okay, we're done fire hosing you. That's what, understand, that's what, if, you, if you're thinking like, wow, we just got, felt, we felt like we just got hit with a 300 PSI fire hose, blame April, okay. It was our intention. That was the intention. Yep. There's more out there. Uh, we're open for questions now. I think we're open for discussion. No questions, no discussion. Lunch. There, there is one thing I'm that I... I'm trying to read the, the hand wanna, signals here. I do want to say one thing. You, there is um, the, uh, the Boeing case is kind of in the news right now. And it was at the new, in the news when I finished this book. Um, and I have a long history with Boeing. Um, all of it good. Uh, except we just, you know, have really struggled with their top management. But other than that, the people are awesome. You can download that case for free, and I think it's very interesting reading. If you're interested in this at all, you can download that case for free on demand-driven performance, and it really is about project management and where they went wrong and why it happened. And we predicted, we predicted it, we tried to stop them, I, uh, Steve Holt here, um, tried to talk to them with the SPIA engineering had asked us to do it, and it didn't work. They outsourced their engineering, predicted it would happen. It did happen right at the end of the book. I wrote the case, and again, they're back in the news, and that, that, that program will never make money, okay? And knew that before they even started to outsource it. So it's a pretty good case, and I think it might make some sense to you guys. You might have some fun with it. Okay, I think we're done.